Welcome to Board Game Archaeologist, where we play time-worn games from the past. I'm Hunter. I'm Rob. And today, we're looking at Monopoly. Monopoly, tried and true. Created in 1903 as the Landlord Game by Lizzie McGee. Later, played by Charles Darrow and redeveloped into the game that we know and love. Parker Brothers picked it up in 1935, and this has been pretty much the game since then. The objective of the game is to become the wealthiest player through buying, selling, and renting property. Yep, and it comes with the board, your hotels, houses, your chance cards, your community chest cards, your eight metal uh, pieces, and your properties, your utilities, and your railroads, plus your money, ones, fives, tens, twenties, fifties, hundreds, and five hundreds. Well, to start out, you need to find a banker, usually someone you trust, just someone to manage, you know, handing things out. Next, you need to pick out a piece to represent yourself, and each player gets 1500 bucks. Each player will take their turn rolling the dice, and the highest roller will go first. When the highest roller goes first, they'll use both of their die to move around the board, and they'll come across things like property spaces, which they can choose to buy, or not, and if they choose not to, it's put up in auction. Yeah, and that's something that uh, I have to say that we didn't do a lot when we were growing up, is if, if you didn't want it, you would just keep going, and that's not the way it plays. It's not the rules to play with it. Um, and the pieces on the board are the properties, where you've got your properties starting with a Mediterranean and going all the way to Boardwalk, and this is really how you make your money. The utilities are a property too, but their rent is more a percentage to your dice roll. And then you have the railroad, and that just depends upon how many railroads you own out of the four. If you own one, you get 25 bucks for rent. If you own two, you get 50, three, you get 100. And if you own all four railroads, you get 200. And when it comes to other tile pieces, we also have the, you know, the go space where, as everyone knows, when you pass go, you get $200. There's also, with the jail, you can be visiting jail. So if you land on it, you're not in jail. You're just visiting. It's kind of like the free parking. And the free parking is just a neutral space, a place that your character can just lay low. It'll become very valuable near the end of the game, less so in the earlier spot. The go to jail uh, space is one of the few ways that you do go to jail. Another being if you roll three doubles in a row, right? which is a really, really unlucky thing to do, uh, then you get sent to jail. Right, and when you're in jail, you either... Uh, you can roll three turns to try to get doubles again to get out, or you can pay $50 to get out. A couple other spaces on the board is the luxury tax, and that you pay $75, and your income tax, which is pay 10% of your total gross or your total property and your money and your houses and everything, or you pay $200. And that's one of those places where you tend to spend $200 because you're too lazy to count everything else up. Basically, if you have over $2,000 worth of places, you could just pay your $200. And there's really not too many other type of tiles to land on. Like the chance card, you can kind of sell an option almost anything that, that you can find. Like uh, if you pick up a card that says, go back three spaces, if that's not really worth a whole lot to you, you can choose to sell it to an opponent if they're willing to buy it. Yep. The whole game is about negotiation and trade. The only community chess and um, chance card I think that are that you hold on to is the get out of jail free card. So to me, that's got value to it because there are times in the game where you want to get out of jail instantly, like in the beginning, and there are also times you want to stay in jail. Because there's uh, while in jail, you can still collect on things like rent. Like you can still do a lot of the passive incomes, and if you're willing to wait, then you can get out of jail without having to pay. Right, and that's really important near the end of the game when you got hotels and. Um, houses all over the place and maybe jail is your safest place to be at that point it's hard to only aim for free parking because it's something that isn't really super beneficial in the early game but becomes increasingly valuable as it goes on right and that's another one of those rules that i we played wrong and i don't know if we knowingly played wrong or not but all the rules we read and everything i've ever heard is do not put money on free parking it just makes the game longer and it doesn't really change much of the strategy to the game so if you want a longer game sure put money there so people can keep getting money and keep playing but if you want to play a quicker game like an hour hour and a half to two hours you might want to never put money there and when you do get a chance or a um, community chest or um, something that says the money is owed to the bank it never should go to free parking the bank owns that money 
And another thing with properties is that it's a lot, it, it's much more valuable to have things of a kind. It goes in with the negotiating thing. Right. Where like when people aren't willing, when you have two out of three properties of something, someone could hold on to it just to begrudge you that extra bit. But it's one of those things that can really elongate the game. Because I used to think of Monopoly as a game that you couldn't play in under three hours. Right. And it's because we were playing with the extra money and not doing the auctioning. So you had to land on the, th on the uh, properties to get them instead of just being able to auction them off. The game is called Monopoly because when you get the three of them, you kind of have a Monopoly. So when, once you have a Monopoly, even if you don't have houses on it, you get to double your rent. So say you have all three of the yellow properties. And at the point you have a Monopoly, you get to double your rent instantly without any houses or anything. Even if you more, um, mortgage a house where you can, if you're running out of money, you can sell your house kind of back, but you're really mortgaging it. So you own it. You only get a percentage of your money but you only have to pay that percentage back to unmortgage it and then make it active again. Once it's mortgaged, you don't get any rent for it, but you still have a monopoly. So you would still double your um, rent if you had no houses. Houses and hotels are another function to the monopoly is when you get a monopoly of three or two, if it's one of the two, then you can buy houses or hotels. When you buy them, they have to be equal. You can't buy three houses for one and, and no houses for the other, just to stack one. It's got to be like one house and then one house on your other property, one house on your third or your second, and then your second or third and then up to your hotel. And the same thing is true for when you sell it. You have to sell your houses first in kind of that same order um, uh, before you can actually mortgage your property. Yeah, and a huge part of it is like, because there's no real interaction in player pieces when they share a space. But it can definitely, it's just creating traps for everyone else. That's really what Monopoly seems like to me when I think about it in a top-down kind of view. It is. And watching a, a, some documentaries, I had a really good time. And actually, I have a book um, I'll show you right here. My sister gave me when, when we were young because I think I lost a lot and she was getting sick of me losing. So she bought me a book. And, and part of the strategy is, is buy everything. Buy fast, buy everything you can. Every single thing you land on that's going to help you trade or own something and get that rent is important. And like I was saying earlier, um, the reason jail would be good is if you had a bunch of hotels not owned by you in this tract in front of the jail, you just might want to hang out there until somebody lands on maybe one of your, your places to, so you're collecting money. Yeah, or they might have to mortgage some of their stuff and you know, make it a little easier for you on your way out. Right, or they'll trade something they normally wouldn't have traded. And you can also trade, you can basically trade anything at any time. You can trade your uh, properties, you can trade cards. You, you really can't trade where your characters are, but you, you really have the opportunity to work with anybody and it doesn't have to be your turn. I think there's a number of things. There's, um, you can buy houses, you can... Um, um, trade properties, you can auction off properties, and there's, I think, one more thing um, that you don't have to do in your turn. You can do it during anybody's turn. And that kind of ties into, when I get into kind of like the pros and cons of the game, for me, I used to really kind of stay away from Monopoly because I used to associate it with it being like a really long game. Like, there was almost no way to get around. It's like playing war with a friend, where you just, you, you flip a coin, and you go, uh, you know, it's back and forth. But, like, once we kind of figured out that we weren't always playing 100% the way it was meant to be, a lot of that kind of goes away. It's still, like, a longer game for certain. But. It is a longer game. But the one thing that I really love about Monopoly is that there has literally been hundreds of different versions of Monopoly. Um, so you can play Justice League Simpsons, which you're going to see in the next episode where we show you, uh, I think we have eight different versions of Monopoly here, and we're just going to show you the differences and let you know if there's any rule changes or not. But going back to your pros and cons, was there anything that you really didn't like about it outside of the time limit? I think that there is a degree of like skill employed where like you get into something, and it, I think we had this kind of dialogue with Smess, where I saw where a lot of things could fit together, but you bring someone in who really knows the board well, and I think there could be a huge, it's like chess where like exactly. you can play against someone and you're like, oof, I, I just can't play against you. And Monopoly is one of those games where I think if you know what you're doing and you're playing with someone that doesn't, 
it might not be as much fun for the person who doesn't. Right. And I think at that point, people don't trade as much because if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to be really apprehensive to trade, which I certainly would be too if I was playing somebody better than me and knowing. Um, the one thing that I do know and the one piece of strategy I can give you pretty quickly is the go to jail things here. So these ones are a lot less landed on than these ones. So if you're going to have to pick a monopoly on one side of the board or the other, I would stay on this side more so than these. But of course, buy them all because that's really the goal is to own them all. So you're really going to want to put money into it all. Pros and cons for me. This is a tried and true game forever and ever. Um, I love the game. Um, I like it better maybe when I'm playing the Justice League or when I'm playing SpongeBob or Walking Dead or Cthulhu, which we have, and we'll show you pieces to that and, and the game board differences to that next episode. But there's really no cons. It's what it is, and it's been there for a long time. Well, thanks for watching. Yeah, and if you want to know more about us, check us out at toyarchaeology.com. You can find us on Facebook as a group and a page. And don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.